it's Wednesday night, and I'm trying to fill you in on some things in the Bible. I was teaching one night back months ago. I don't know how many months ago, six, eight months ago. And I was teaching on Hebrews and Revelation. Hebrews is a, is a Jewish book, and so is the book of Revelation. All of the Jewishness in the book of Hebrews is about the church. Well, so is Revelation. Revelation is about the church, but it's about the Jews. You got the seven candlesticks in the first chapter. You got the Ark of the Covenant or the throne of God in the fourth chapter and the 15th chapter and several other places. And uh, what? And I got to, to the point, this is how I'm led. Go back over here to Hebrews. I'm, I'm led from one thing to the other. Everything that I do is like a path. It's like psh, everything I teach is in a series. And I can step off of that series at every point in time with any given subject. And I do that often. So here's, it's because I want you to see how these things tie together. Let me separate this up here. All right. And I got over here into Hebrews, the third chapter. I think about teaching you all of this, and I don't know exactly how to get it all over to you, but look over here in Hebrews, the third chapter. When you look at Hebrews, the first chapter, it's talking about the church. But it's talking about the church in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, the New Testament church. There's one verse in Hebrews that will show you that the temple over here in the Old Testament, over here, and you got a temple in the New Testament, but the temple over here is spiritual and you can't see it because it's you. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which temple you are. And he said, man, the Lord says that over and over in the New Testament. And the everything over here, when you get into Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, you get into everything that was over here in the Old Testament. This over here equals this over here. In fact, if I could draw the temple like this, Just like you're making it out of dotted lines because it's not it's not literal, it's spiritual. It's a spiritual temple. And we saw back here, you take one thing at a time. The Ark of the Covenant was inside the Holy of Holies. This is the holy place out here. This is the outer the outer sanctuary. This is the inner sanctuary. The word sanctuary comes from the word saint. Saint comes from the word holy, hagios. Hagios is the word saint, and it's the word holy. Same word, holy, saint. So if someone speaks of being a saint, we're already being saints or made saints. Holy, holy uh, hagios means to be pure. And it takes fire and trials and tribulation to make you pure and make you give up self. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled there in Hebrews 10, 22, sprinkled. And, the, and our hearts are sprinkled over here. The law is written on tables of stone over here there in De Deuteronomy 9. And the law is written on fleshy tables of our hearts over here. Now, people get angry when you call the church spiritual Israel. I don't know if y'all know that. Did you know? Did anybody know that? Well, they get enraged. Preachers get enraged. And it's all through the New Testament. And the... And the law is written on fleshy tables of our hearts 
and the law was written on tables of stone over here. It looks like it's exactly the same thing. This inner sanctuary was called house of God. That's what it's called over here. And over here, Hebrews 3 and 6 says, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we? Now, I can go through all this. I'm not going to go through all of it. There's the candlesticks. Here's the altar of incense. And here is the table of showbread. And the Bible says in Revelation 1 and 20, it says before that that there are, he said there's seven candlesticks and there's seven stars in his right hand. He said the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Boy, that sure sounds Jewish to me, doesn't it, you? So the, the seven stars are the seven angels, seven angels. And the word angel, always remember, it's merely the word Angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. Two G's together is pronounced N-G. N-G. Angelos. <clears throat> and Angelos is the word, common Greek word for messenger. That's all it means. That can be a heavenly messenger like Gabriel, or it can be a heavenly messenger like Michael, or it can be an earthly messenger in a church like me preaching to you. Wherever you have a message, I don't care if, you, if it's taking a message down the street to somebody and say, your car's in the ditch, you're an angel. You're just a messenger saying that. Now, all of this goes together, but let me show you something. Let me show you, leaving that on the board, leaving this on the board. The one verse in Hebrews, in Hebrews 9, that explains, that says, this over here on the left is not the real thing. The tabernacle in the Old Testament wasn't the real thing. The tabernacle in the, new, in the new is you, and you're the real thing. This is the real thing. God's elect family, which is his temple. And he will say that in this one verse here in chapter 9 of Hebrews. And if you don't remember any verse in this book, this is the one you need to remember. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, verse 8. Verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest, the holiest is the holy of holies. The way into the holiest was not, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Manifest means to open up and make known. It wasn't made known while as the first tabernacle was standing this has no meaning after all that's blotted out and this is what has meaning to us and the and the and the altar of incense is the prayers of the saints according to revelation the fourth chapter and fifth chapter prayers of saints the the table of showbread is the church. The Bible says, we being many are one bread and one body. And this is the church, the seven candlesticks. And I go through that on Sunday night. And I'm not, but he says, the real is the spiritual, not the literal. So we are spiritual Israel, spiritual Jews. A Jew is not outwardly, but of the heart. I don't know why people have a hard time seeing that. We're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It's the circumcision of our hearts. Now, go back over here. I want to take, one of these days, take time and just go through Hebrews and show you that it's all spiritual now. In fact, the Bible says in the 8th chapter of Hebrews, there is a first testimony, and that's this one over here, and then there is a real testimony, and that's the one over here, and that's us. 
And if you don't understand spiritual Israel, you can't understand the Bible. Now go back over here. This is where this is what led me to studying the book of Numbers. I was going along here in Hebrews, the third chapter, and I got down to this eighth verse. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. The provocation was while Israel was going through the desert. Here's Egypt, Egypt, and then you have Sinai Peninsula. It comes up here to Israel on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. And I got into this chapter here, and it took me into the, into the wilderness, and all through the wilderness, Israel provoked God. Now this is, and God says to us, this is a picture of us in the New Testament times when Israel is spiritual and the temple is spiritual and the Ark of the Covenant is spiritual and that's our hearts and here's our prayers and here's the bread we eat of, which is the church and so forth and the candlesticks is the church and the sea that is where we're washed in the blood of Christ and then you had the altar here and on that altar was offered sacrifices every day, a lamb in the morning, a lamb in the evening, at sun up, at sun up uh, and sundown, and we're lambs to the slaughter daily, and the lambs were offered there on that altar. Now, let's go back here and just, and this is what led me. I don't know if you remember this, but it led me over, and I'm here in Hebrews 3 and 4. And that led me back to the book of Numbers because God is comparing us. Why the book of Numbers? Because Israel's journey through the wilderness was in that book. When you look Numbers, you think Numbers, that's just numbering Israel. No, no, that's the journey of Israel from Mount Sinai up to Kadesh Barnea and Israel, as soon as they got in the wilderness, God is comparing our murmuring. And what took me into this particular murmuring was that God works all things after the counts of his own will, the good and the evil. God works everything. Uh, First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks. Everything. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, and it's a picture of Israel in the wilderness. And he and the Lord, when they get up to Kadesh Barnea, Kadesh Barnea, God tells Israel to go into this land of Anak, or later on it would be called the land of the Philistines. And then during our day and time, that would be called the Gaza Strip because it's just a strip of land, Gaza Strip. And in the ancient world, and they said it was Anak, and there were giants in that land. And God says, go up there and scout the land out and take men, take all the men, who are of military age. And that age was 20 years old and upward. You had to be 20 to serve in Israel's army. I said it last week, David wasn't a pansy kid as they make him out to be as a shepherd boy. Shepherd boy was very wiry and very muscular. And they could take that sling and just cut down anything with it from 50, 75 yards away. David said, I, I killed a bear with this club, and I've, I've killed a lion. So he couldn't have been a sissy. He just wasn't old enough to be in Saul's army yet. Because as soon as he kills Goliath, 
As soon as he kills Goliath, he's taken into the court of King Saul. And Saul gets jealous of him right away because the women are singing a song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands and he's going, Rrr, they're giving him more credit than me and I'm the king. Well, he takes David and puts him in charge of his bodyguard. How could David, a few days before that, have been a skinny little guy? He wasn't some skinny little shepherd boy. He was a very dangerous guy if you went to war with him. Because he went out there and said, I can kill that giant. I can hit him right between the eyes. All those shepherd boys were experts with those. If they had a right... They had to have a little round stone, a smooth stone. That's why I picked up smooth stones. If you don't have a smooth stone, you got jagged stones, the stone will go, go every direction. It's like having a spitball, you know. They put a little spit on a spitball, and they're playing ball, and it'll make that ball go crazy. Well, if you don't have exactly round stone, smooth, David said, I can hit him. I don't even have to get close to him. I'll have him down on the ground. Very few people were that good, but he was that good. That's the reason he wasn't in the army. So the Lord says, take all these military men, go into the land of Anak. It's southwest. It's on the southwest border of Israel. Gaza Strip right there. The Dead Sea is right here. Jordan River is right here. The... Sea of Galilee is right there. Sea of Galilee is the source of the Jordan River, and it flows right into the Dead Sea. So, <clears throat> the Lord tells them to go in there. They go in and scout the land out, and these guys are giants. They're huge. And they come back. One of them comes back with a... Two of them are carrying a cluster of grapes on a, on a pole. One's here, and the other's in front of him. And it's a rich land. And they said, but we can't go in and conquer these people. And God says, just for that, he tells them, I'm going to make you wander in this wilderness till all the men 20 years old and upward are dead. And what I'm going to do is take the number of days that you were over there scouting the land out, which was 40 days, Four is a very significant number. Four judgments. God says four times, I'll bring the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast against you. And that's constantly, I'm not going to get into the numbers on that right now. But I'm going to make you wonder, 40 years in the wilderness, for every day you are in the land, I'm going to take a year until I kill off all unbelief. And he makes the statement, you will not enter into my rest because of unbelief. Unbelief is not merely not believing in God. You have to learn to believe that everything that's going on is the will of God in your life. Everything. That's the most rest that I've ever been able to come to I preach predestination, the sovereignty of God, all my life. But up until the last eight or ten years, I've come into the conclusion it doesn't matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter wh how angry people get at me, how they will try to destroy the ministry. It doesn't matter. Because everything that's going on is the will of God, and it's the trials He's putting me through to make me strong. I don't worry about anything anymore. I'm, I'm an amazing person. I was one of the sickest people you would ever run across in my 40s. Coughed and hacked and spit all the time, all through my 20s and through my 40s. And I stayed stressed out constantly because I wanted to be somebody and be important. When God finally stuck me in a hospital, it was God that did it. And he was killing me to the point that I, he brought me to a place where I said, all right, Lord, this is me and you against the world. 
from now on I'm going to preach to everybody and I'm going to start with these doctors and nurses in this hospital. And I woke up one day and said, Lord, I give up, I surrender. If God's never made you surrender due to a lot of fire and trials, you got something to learn yet. But I, what's standing before you is literally a miracle. Go listen to some of my old tapes out of when I was in my mid-50s. I'm coughing and hacking to get through the whole message, and I did that for years. And God's brought me to a place of realizing everything is of Him. When you start doing that, you start believing God completely. Believing God completely. If you can come to that, life becomes tolerable. Don't care what your situation is, how much or how little money you got. Life becomes tolerable. When you learn that, and he's saying, these people, every time I bring them up against some great enemy, they, they'd start murmuring and griping and complaining just like we do over here. And he, when they came out of Egypt, they complained coming out of Egypt. They would go through the... Why would God bring them through the Red Sea and drown Pharaoh's army and then not be able to help them beat these an men of Anak up here? And everywhere they camped, they'd gripe, we don't have any water. We want some meat. We want some doves. We're tired of bread in the morning and no meat. Give us meat to eat. Have you ever been like that in your life, griping about everything that comes along and complaining? You ever done that? It's wrong. If when you really truly believe predestination, you're going to believe that God's predestined you to conform to Christ's image or His likeness. That's the word image. And that is a lot of pain. That's a lot of sorrow. That's a lot of grief. And when you come to that place, then you will quit complaining like these people in the wilderness. So there's got to be a lot of dead men at the end of that 40 years. And there is a lot of dead people. And we have a dead man that's living in us. And if God will put you through enough fire, trials, and persecution, and persecution, if he'll put you through enough, that's the fiery trial that is to try you. He'll cause you to ignore this outer man and kill him off. I'm at a place I don't really care what happens. I believe God is in charge. He's going to do what he wants in your life and in mine. If you can come to that place, I know that all of you have not come to that place, have you? Huh? You have to get old. You have to get tired of yourself, not tired of life, tired of yourself. Self gets in your way. It worries, it stresses, it says, oh, that guy's, I got to get him back, or I got to get this done or that done. If your car breaks down on a highway in the middle of the desert, that's the will of God. Those are the things we can't get a hold of. Well, I got this cancer in me. Well, that's the will of God, too. Whatever happens is what God wants because he works all things after the council of his own will. He's talking about while we're in the desert and we're in the desert over here with a dead man on the outside of us and God says, I've got to put you through enough trials where you and your mind will quit considering that outer man. And it takes a long time to get there. If you don't get there, you'll die of stress. You'll die of a heart attack. You'll die of bronchial asthma. I've had that. I was thinking shaving the other day, just remember thinking, I was hacking and coughing in this season every year for 20, 25 years. Why am I not doing it now? It has to be a change of mind. When God changes your mind, your whole world changes not immediately but you gradually grow out of that outer man and say Lord I'm going to be content with whatever you do now 
Now let's continue reading here. I was grieved with that generation. Well, he says in verse 9 of chapter 3, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years. His works was to kill off all the unbelievers. There was a man over there in the ninth chapter of Mark said, Lord, I believe, but there's a part of me that don't believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The part of me that just has a hard time believing you. Help my unbelief. Faith has to increase. Believe is the word faith. It's the verb form. Our faith must increase, and as it increases, then we get to where we don't care what men do to us. Paul said, I shall not fear what men shall do to me, for the Lord is my helper. Now, so he said, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. When you try to correct God and say, I don't like what's going on, he says, you haven't known my ways the way I do things. It is a miracle this ministry is on TV in over 200 towns and cities. We're on the Internet 24 hours a day all over the world. We're about to go on uh, direct TV where the 21 to 24 million people a day will have access to us. It's, I don't see where this ministry came from because I've never tried to build a church. I've just said, Lord, I will teach the truth. So I swear in not my wrath, if it was God's wrath, it's not my, it's tay or gay, feminine gender. This is the Greek word, and the ada is always feminine. Always. Tau Eta is the wrath feminine. And it's feminine because Babylon mothered all idolatry and she was founded on let us make us a name. And she was the mother, the mother, the female feminine of all idolatry. The mother of all evil. So that's why this there's another mistake in the King James Bible. Well, I'll point them out to you as we go along. It's wrong. They took the, a feminine gender, definite article, which is an adjective, and translated it over into a po possessive pronoun, possessive pronoun, my, and took the from the Greek, feminine gender, and translated it over to my. Can you do that? No, you can't do that, but they did. And it's wrong, and it's a King James Bible, but I use a King James because it comes from the correct text, the text that's receptive. It comes from the right text, the King James is not the inspired word of God. The Textus Receptus is, and you've got it in the form of an interlinear Bible. i got one over here somewhere. All right, now let's keep reading here. Take heed, brethren, lest that there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Well, he's talking to believers here. You mean you can have some unbelief in your heart? Yeah, when everything gets bad, you start worrying, stressing out, and you end up in the hospital because you're worrying. And <clears throat> stress breaks down and accelerates every problem in your life. Every disease you have, every weak system will be out of kelter when you worry and stress because this is God's doing. Everything, everything in your life. That's a hard thing to believe, isn't it? Huh? Isn't that hard, Teresa? That everything that's going on is what's supposed to go on in your life. Can you fix it? No. <laughs> you can't fix God's doing. And sometimes you go down the road and you say, Boy, I used to stress over this, but that seems so insignificant. You ever gone through something like that? 
I thought I'd die while I was going through this, but now it doesn't even matter what that was. <laughs> That's the way I look at things back in the 60s when I was just, so oh, I got to be successful. <laughs> oh, 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 there goes my heart. <laughs> Boy, I used to cough all the time. An evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. When you're, as a believer, when you're not believing, you're departing from God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, that's what will lead people away from the truth, is sin is deceitful when it feels good. I don't think it, God minds if I do this and this and this and this. He minds if all you do is look after yourself. For we are made protectors of Christ if we behold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, if you will obey his voice, hear and obey are the same thing. Harden not your hearts as in the days when they provoked God in the wilderness. And every difficulty they came up against. They said, we can't get over that. We got no water out here. We need more meat. They were screaming and angry at God all the way through the book of Numbers. I think that's the way Americans are. If times get tough, to some when, he, when they heard did provoke, they provoked God, griping and complaining, how be it, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved for 40 years. It wasn't everybody that came out of Egypt. It was those that didn't believe in the wilderness. God says, I'll kill them. And he did. When you get to the book of Deuteronomy, you're at the end of the law, and that's right before they cross the river and take charge. All the people in Israel are believers by that point because God has killed off all the unbelief. So when he's talking to them, he's talking to a congregation of believing people in the church. For with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Was it not in our day and time when that old dead man falls off of us in this wilderness? Then he says those wonderful words, When to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? Israel was compared with the rest, and we enter into the rest. The word rest is called apostis. It comes from paus, P A U S E, and kata means down. It means to settle down settle down you kids settle down Mary always tells Christopher and Jonathan if they're running through the house cut up horses that's what you need to tell them settle down you need to say that Scott you got a house full cut up horses and that's the ones that did, he says so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, enter into the rest, and that's the same word that's used for the Sabbath rest. The true Sabbath is every day when we begin to believe God. It's not the seventh day. It's every day. They didn't turn the, the Sabbath into Sunday. It's a completely different day. Sunday is the Lord's day. We meet on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on that day. Not because it's the Sabbath. And it wasn't replacing the Sabbath. If it was, then we'd have no Sabbath. The Sabbath is when we learn to believe God in everything He's doing. So I got over here, and if you go into the fourth chapter, it compares this rest with the Sabbath. I'm going to go ahead. It's been a while since I've touched on this. Let me go ahead and read the fourth chapter, at least part of it. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his katapasis, his rest. 
The word Sabbath means rest. It doesn't mean seventh. Sabbat, Shabbat, it means rest. If we learn to believe God about everything into our lives, the older you get, the longer you live, the more fire you go through, the more you begin to rest in it. Have you ever noticed that old people rest? And young people are jumping around, bouncing around, going, why aren't you jumping around? I'm having fun. We've already tried that, and it don't work. So you jump around until you quit, okay? And then he compares this rest with the Sabbath in these next couple of verses. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them in the wilderness. Notice this is us, the church, and them. But the word preached did not profit them because they weren't believing God, not being mixed with faith, which is death to self, which is belief. Faith is the noun form of believe. Faith, faith is the word P-I-S-T-I-S. -I believe is the word P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Believe is the verb, faith is the noun. It's real simple. Now, for unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For Now notice what he does right here. He compares this rest he's talking about with the Sabbath. For we which have believed that everything that's going on and all this opposition that we get over here in the wilderness that God's going to conquer these giants because he conquered Pharaoh's armies and drowned him and all of his armies and he conquered all the enemies when they would come up against him and everything that happened he, he'd give them doves, bread in the morning doves in the evening they complained he'd give to them you think God brought us out here to die God didn't bring them out here to die that you brought us out here to die, Aaron and Moses, and we're complaining about you, and we're mad at you for bringing us out here, and we're going to... Have you ever worried about whether you you thought things were so bad it was just going to destroy your whole life? And did it do it? No. Then he goes on to say, For we which have believed do enter into rest. We enter into the katapasis, the spiritual Sabbath. The best thing you can do is not worry about things. Just do a good job, work hard, do your job, but don't worry about the results. The results has already been ordained by God, but it's also been ordained that we be like Christ in His likeness and be responsible enough to work, not overwork, but put in a good 40-hour week and let God handle the rest because he's going to anyway regardless of how much you worry about it. He's already handled in his mind before the foundation of the world. For we which believe, believe what? Believe everything. And that'll be increasing faith as you grow older. Your faith will increase. The Bible says over in the 13th chapter of Matthew concerning faith. Look at that. Matthew 13. Let me see here. All right. This is what has to happen to your faith. It has to grow. Verse 31. Another parable he set forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, or the church, or Israel, while we're over here in this spiritual tabernacle, and they were in a literal tabernacle, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. In one of the gardens in Israel, they would plant a grain of mustard seed, and it was as small as a grain of pepper. That's pretty small. And then he says, Which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of seeds, but when it is grown, 
it is the greatest of herbs. Oh, he's talking about this is what your faith has to be like. It'll start off teeny tiny little faith. It'll start off oligos pistis puny faith. Let's start off. O L I G O S P I S T I S. Puny, minute, small faith. And it will grow as it does. You'll get stronger and stronger and stronger in believing that God's doing everything. And it'll grow to the tallest of herbs. It actually grows to be about 17, 18 feet tall. When it is as small as a grain of pepper, the birds love it. It's a delicacy. They come out there and pick it up off the ground. They love it. But watch what he says happens with the birds when your faith grows like a mustard seed grows. Like doesn't mean have a little bitty tiny People wear those, used to wear those bracelets, had a little bitty tiny mustard seed in it. It doesn't say if you'll have grace, if you'll have faith as small as a tiny grain of mustard seed and it never grows. He's talking about, he's talking about the ratio between when it's a small, about the size of a grain of pepper, and when it's grown. Watch what he says. All right. And when it is grown, it is the greatest of herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in its branches. What used to have been its enemy, and we pluck it up, all these little grains, the birds come and fly in the middle of the branches of us. And this is a picture of Satan, and he can't affect us. What can a bird do to a branch? Nothing. Sit on it. Huh? Sit on it. Sit on it. That's right. Now let's go back over here. So this is what belief is. When your faith increases, Paul said, you'll quit complaining against me and you'll start lifting me up. People that complain against me is because they have little bitty tiny faith. And then he says over here in Hebrews 4, he compares this with the Sabbath, this rest. What I did in my Bible, everywhere it's got rest and it's called apostles, I put a circle, a red circle around each one of the words that's called apostles. And that way you can see what it's talking about. And then he says, he compares in verse 3 this rest of belief with the Sabbath. That's why the Sabbath is not every Saturday. It's every day for the believer. It's talking about our resting in our day and time, and they didn't rest over here, and God was delivering them right and left from every kind of adversary. <coughs> then he says, he compares this rest, this catapulsis, with the Sabbath. He says in verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into Rest into catapuses, settling down in our minds. Wouldn't it be, if God is doing everything, and that's part of his predestining process, and it's going to be, no matter what you do and what you worry about, it's going to be anyway, wouldn't it be better just to accept what God's going to do rather than fight with it? God, I don't like this, and this guy, and that person, and, and they're stealing my money, and they're... Has anybody ever stole from you? Were you able to get it back? <laughs> I've had people come in here and steal from this ministry. Am I going to chase them back? You give me that back. No. If they can live with it, I can live without it. I've learned that. And then he goes on to say, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, or the wrath, if they enter into my rest, though the works were finished from the foundation of the world, all of the works that God is doing. 
the Bible says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning. And what are all his works? Everything he's doing in everybody's life. Everything. The good and the bad, yes. The evil, I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, yes. You never know what the future holds, like that old song says. But I know who holds the future because he's got it in his hand. He's already written it down. Then he says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day. Now he's comparing this rest that we're in in this generation with their not resting over here. So he said, I got to kill off all unbelief here. And he's got to kill off all unbelief over here, which is the outer man. And the longer you go through trials and persecution, the more you will understand this is all the will of God. He said, so he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did kataposis. God did rest. There is a Sabbath day. There's a Sabbath day. A Sabbath day. And then there is rest. This is the... This is what you do on the Sabbath day. You call to That's every day. On the... You rest. Every day is the Sabbath. Sabbath means to rest. Rest equals rest. And people are not going to understand that if they believe the Sabbath is Saturday or Sunday. Will they? Won't understand that. And if they don't believe in predestination, God ordaining everything, they're never going to understand it. They'll worry their way all the way to the grave. I'm not going to do that no more. I used to do that every day. Worry, stress, push, 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 push. Success, success. I got to be successful. I got to be successful in the real estate. I got to be successful in the ministry. I got to get this thing going. I got to get everything bad. I didn't want to slow down. I take it as it comes now. I have people fight me, argue with me. I say, okay. <laughs> if you won't fight somebody, how are they going to fight you? They can't. <laughs> they can't. You got to have somebody to fight back. And I won't do it. I won't fight anybody. All right. And he says, where was I there? He didn't say that. but For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on, on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. He's saying, if these people enter into, into Canaan's land, and if we will enter into God's rest, and every day is the Sabbath, we learn, you can't enter into everyday rest until you begin to believe that everything is ordained by God, the good and the evil and everything, car wrecks, heart attacks. What about little kids being killed over in, in Africa? You can't say except that, that too. People say, I'll just, I had one guy used to come here. He said, well, I went to, I went over to China and, and worked over there and I saw all these kids starving to death and I, just, I decided I didn't believe in predestination, didn't believe God would do that. I do. You have to believe God in everything. You don't know the end results. You don't know who's a believer, who's not, which child hasn't come to the unaccountable age yet and don't know right from wrong. You don't know that. Yeah, he killed all the firstborn of Egypt, didn't he? <coughs> yeah, how can he kill all the firstborn of Egypt and not kill these people overseas? Then he says, If they will enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not into the rest because of their unbelief. They didn't believe God could conquer all of these problems they had over here. Perhaps you've not believed that in your life. God can't fix this. He'll fix it the way He wants to, and all He wants you to do to rest in what He does. 
What is it you're worrying about? Do you know that wouldn't mean anything to some guy that lived on a farm in 1850, what you're worrying about? You're worrying about your car and all he was concerned about whether he's going to get a new horse for his carriage. We're not thinking about horses in carriages, are we? They were. That was everything back then to them. It all depends on where you're living and where your mind is as to what you're thinking. And he goes on and says again, or in verse 6, Sing therefore it remaineth... Huh? Okay, verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, believers. It's the believer that gets their hearts hardened. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore... There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And that word rest right there, Sabbath. sabbatismos. Notice he's comparing the Sabbath. He's comparing the Sabbath with the kataposis, isn't he? But you can't get involved in the kataposis unless you believe that God is doing everything. That's hard to get a hold of for people, isn't it? If you're a believer and your husband, find you find out he's running around on you and you're a believer, all these things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. It is the will of God. Well, will they suffer for that? Yes. Even though God has arranged the sin, God has arranged the sin because he hasn't redeemed everybody. You've got vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. You've got vessels of mercy, which God has afore prepared to glory. And, the vessels, and the, those that are fitted for destruction, those people, they don't have a chance in eternity. And people don't like that, but that's too bad. That's God said they were vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. See, all of it goes together. Believing God is believing everything that he's doing is what he wants to do with your life. And then he goes on to say, if Jesus had given them rest, no, wait, I was down here in verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest, a Sabbath, to the people of God, and it is this kataposis resting, resting from unbelief, getting away from unbelief. For he that is entered into his, into his rest, into his sabbatismos, he also has ceased from his own works. What's he talking about? You've ceased from your sin. It is sin to worry. And think that God can't take you through the wilderness. For he is entered into his rest. He hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor. What? Spudazzo. S-P-O-U-D-A-Z-O. Spudazzo means with great speed, let's labor to enter into God's rest. I thought you didn't labor. Well, you don't work, but you do the works of Christ. We're, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God hath before day that we should walk in them. So we walk resting, working for God. And there's nothing like it. To get older, stop worrying about the world, stop worrying about people. I used to worry about people not coming here. I don't do that anymore. I tell people now, 
If you're not there, you're not supposed to be there. God didn't work it for you to be there. Isn't that what he says? Didn't he say that? If you're not here, you're not supposed to be. Well, Jim, I'm sorry I wasn't there Sunday. Uh, uh, this and that. And I've had people make the biggest excuse. I had one guy used to come here years ago and claim to really be into this message. He said, Jim, hey, Jim, I, I'm sorry I wasn't there Sunday night. I, I, I was down at Kmart, and I, all of a sudden I looked at my watch. It was 7.30, and I said, oh, my goodness, I'm missing church. Boy, what a lame excuse. If you just told me I decided to go to Kmart, I had some shopping to do, i say, okay. I'm not going to tell you when to be convicted, or I'm not going to tell you how necessary it is for you to be at Kmart so you can buy some school clothes for the kids because they start the school on Monday. I'm not going to be your conscience. You be your own conscience. But don't, if you're somewhere, you're supposed to be there, aren't you? God has to work on your conscience, not on your desire to look good in the sight of people. Now, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. This is a battle between belief, which is, which is resting, and unbelief, which is not resting. That's what it is. Now, I went back through this because I hadn't said this in a long time. I think I made it clearer this time. Each time I preach something, I make it clearer. What this did, when I preached this the first time, it took me back to Israel in the wilderness. So I said, let's go back over here. And we talked through, let's turn back over there to Numbers. We taught Israel leaving Egypt in the 10 plagues. The 10th plague was the Passover and showed them leaving Egypt in the, in the 12th, 13th chapter of Exodus then showed them going through the Red Sea in the 14th chapter. And then they, Pharaoh's armies are drowned. And then they end up going to the mountain of God. And they start complaining as soon as they get in the desert. And they gripe all the way. What God is saying, you want a Sabbath of rest. You want to rest over all this stuff you're going through. It won't be a change of events. It'll be the same events. There'll be a change in your mind and in mine. That's where it changes. When you really believe predestination, the sovereignty of God, you'll say this is what God wants. Now, what we did, we worked our way. Israel going through the Red Sea. We walked, we worked our way all the way up into Numbers, into Numbers where they left Mount Sinai. They left Mount Sinai in Numbers, the 10th chapter. Numbers 10. They had been there at Mount Sinai since Exodus, the 20, no, not 20. The 18th chapter is when they, of Exodus is where they arrived at, at the mountain of God. Remember, four chapters before that is where they're crossing the Red Sea in chapter 14 of Exodus. And the Passover is in the 12th chapter of Exodus. So what's happening between chapter, uh, chapter 18 of Exodus, Moses goes on the mountain of God in the 19th chapter, gets the Ten Commandments, and then he starts and it brings them down in the 20th chapter. We worked our way up to the 26th chapter, and I went off and taught on some other things. I know what they were, but I don't want to get into them right now. And then I came back, and we resumed our study. And why do I do that? Why do I change the subject? Because you might get wore down with me having the children of Israel. I don't know if you notice, but I'll teach on some place over here in Hebrews and take you back over here to Numbers. If you get weary over listening to one story, I'll say I need to change gears and get them over here and then move them over here i do that it's not a monotony it's very trying on the brain i did a series on the eyes of the lord 
And uh, every every Sunday night I did that. I don't know how long. It's a long time. And it's one of the most complex things I ever taught. And Mary said, are we going to talk about those eyes again tonight? I said, yeah, we probably are. Because <laughs> it's trying on the mind to, to stay in a real difficult subject. You won't even do that as a professor in a college. You'll break it up. So that's what I do. I break it up. When we got to that over there in Hebrews 3 and 4, that took us back over here, and we worked our way through through the Passover. I gave a synopsis of the first ten plagues, uh, first nine plagues, and then the tenth plague was in the twelfth chapter, and that was Passover. And I, I took you back to took you back to the birth of Moses in the Exodus, the second chapter. And then I took you back to the first chapter. That's where Israel is in Egypt, and and they begin to multiply at such a great rate that a new king rose up that did not know Joseph. He knew about him, but he didn't know him. And he gave the order to kill all the male children, and Moses was put in the bulrushes and picked up by Pharaoh's daughter and so forth. And I, I'm going to stop there. Well, anyway, we come up here to Numbers. They're leaving Mount Sinai, and everywhere they go, they don't do nothing but gripe. God is telling us, that is your example. I am your re-reward. A re-reward means I'm taking up the front, and I'm bringing up the rear. Nobody's going to destroy you. I'm taking care of it. But, boy, they didn't believe that after God destroys the greatest army that had been in history up to that point, which was Pharaoh and his armies, and then they don't believe God. Is that any different than America? No different, is it? People in America hate predestination. They hate the idea that God's doing everything. A man who's real successful doesn't want to give anybody credit except himself. I know how those people, I've worked with a lot of rich people in real estate. And I look at them like they're children. Now, what we did, we came up through Numbers. And we went through Numbers where God tells them to go up. And he takes them over there. Over in the, starting about the 10th chapter, they start complaining and griping. He takes them on up through in that 13th, 14th chapter. He's taken them over up there in the land. They murmur against God. They gripe and say, we're not going up there and fighting those giants. They do a lot like we do over here. Because we are that spiritual tabernacle. Where that took me to? How much time do I have, Mike? Do I have any more time? Yeah, minutes. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, this takes me over here. When you're in the... I went through this 16th chapter. That's where they're murmuring against Moses and Aaron. Said, you take too much upon yourselves. It was the episode with Korah. And Korah was a real famous very infamous, rebellious, rebellious man. He's spoken of over there in Judah, uh, Jude, the book of Jude. Now, what we did, it took us through this 16th chapter. And what I'm doing, I'm just covering a lot of these chapters so you can see what they're about. I can't tell you what they're all about. You have to come to every Wednesday night service. If you want all these, we'll give them to you one at a time. But you've got to spend some time with us to learn these things. We've covered a lot of territory. If you really want it, you can have it. But you've got to watch it. You've got to study it. You've got to listen to it. A lot of people say, I'd really like to learn a lot about the Bible, but they don't want to take time to sit down and listen to it. It's like saying, I want to be a calculus professor. Well, have you had 
any math? No. Have you ever had arithmetic? No. Well, you got a long way to go. If you really want to learn, take the DVDs and watch them. But if you'd rather play video games, forget it. You're not going to learn. People say, how'd you learn all that? Well, I started studying 60 years ago. And I've spent a lot of time, and I hadn't remembered a whole lot of what I've studied. Remember a lot of it. Now, where we, I'm just going to read some of this 17th chapter. The 16th chapter, God killed, God killed 250 men that murmured against him, along with their leader, Korah. And they said, uh, you take too much on yourself, Moses, said Aaron. Well, God had appointed them, and they're murmuring against, when they murmur against the preacher of God, they're murmuring against God's will. So God kills 250 men that bring their censors out. They say, why can't we offer incense to God? First of all, you're not of Aaron's lineage. You have to be of Aaron's lineage. That's Moses' older brother. He was the first high priest, and only his sons could be high priests. And they get mad, and God causes the earth to open up and swallow all these rebellious men. He said he's going to kill off all unbelief, and he's got it going on right here. He said in verse 30 of chapter 16, If the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open up her mouth and swallow them up with all that appertaining to them, and they go quick down into this earthquake, this pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. This is another day of provocation here. And they're not believing God when he appointed Moses and Aaron to be their leaders. And then, they, then people in Israel, they get mad and they get upset. And they start murmuring against God for killing these 250 uh, men of, that were followers of Korah. And so that when, as they murmur against God, let's read some of this. Verse 41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You've killed the people of the Lord when you kill these 250 people. They're murmuring. They didn't even understand that God had Moses kill them. Moses is not the one that opened up the ground and swallowed them up. It was God that did that. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation. Behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among the congregation, this is in verse 45, that I may consume these complainers. God said he's going to kill all the unbelief off because for, for the 40 days they went in and he's going to give them 40 years, and he's going to kill off all unbelief. And here's some of them right here. Consume them in a moment, and they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on an incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700 of the children of Israel. God said, I'm going to kill off all unbelief. And you got some unbelief in you. And when you cut off the unbelief, then you'll begin to rest in the things that God has gone in your life. Beside them that died about the matter of Korah. So there's 14,700 plus the 250 at the first of the church. And God's doing the killing. God said, I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. And Aaron returned unto Moses 
unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague, God stopped the plague. He'd killed over 14,000 people. God does the killing, and you've got an unbelief in your life, and that's the outer man. He might have to put you in the hospital like he did me. He might have to half kill you. And you may wish you were dead. And then you go into chapter 17, and he's setting off who's going to be the high priest in this chapter. Watch what he says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, out of every tribe will be a rod. A rod is a stick. Just a rod you can pick up and, and, it, and you could cast down it and become a serpent or whatever you need to use it for to kill something. And then he says, A rod according to the house of their fathers of all their princes according to the house of their fathers. Twelve rods... Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. Levi is the third born, and Aaron is the son of Levi, well, not a direct son, a grandson of Levi. And for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I met meet with you, and it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose to be high priest of Israel, shall blossom. It will be a dead rod, and I will cause the dead stick to resurrect and come alive. He's saying resurrection will be the one who's going to be the leader of the priest of Israel. And I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the house of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, just a stick, dead sticks. For each prince, there's a leader, and, and for the leadership of Levi. Now notice, Aaron's little brother was Moses. He was three years younger than Aaron. God's going to see Moses is God's leader. But you have to be a son of Aaron to be a high priest. And he's going to show you here. Twelve rods. The rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness and it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded. It was resurrected from a dead stick. There's a resurrection, the sign of God, isn't it? And bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds, just a stick. Well, that's a miracle, isn't it? And the Bible will speak of Aaron's rod that budded was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. You see that in Hebrews 9. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord. Each one of those were leaders of their tribes. Unto the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels, and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. But they still murmured, and God killed them. And if Moses did so as the Lord commanded him, so did he. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? Well, it's up to you. Now, look at one thing over here in Hebrews. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter. 
And this will tell you. Hebrews 9. Remember we read a while ago in verse 8, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the wind of the holiest uh, was not made manifest while this tabernacle was standing. It's got to be this tabernacle here. It has to be us. And then he says here in chapter 9, verse 1, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service. That was the literal tabernacle and the literal priesthood. Now we are priests and kings. And a worldly sanctuary, for there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick. That was created over there in Exodus, the 28th chapter. The 25th chapter, excuse me. And the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, the table of showbread, the candlesticks, the altar of incense. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which is the house of God. That's us. And notice this is the same book where he says, Christ over his own house, whose house are we? Which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant. Some say the golden censer was put between the two cherubim. Between the two cherubim. There was a cherubim here, a cherubim here, and there. The censer was put here, and the and the incense was taken off of this altar, and it had to be had to be burnt with fire from that altar. And then he says, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, that was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant, and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments were kept inside the Ark. The law is written on fleshy tables of our hearts. It was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. See, this is the real here. That over there wasn't the real. The literal is not the real. The spiritual is, is the real. And then we have a high priest over the house of God, and that's Melchizedek. Don't want to get into that. Read 9 and 10. Huh? You didn't read that far ago. 9 and 10. Read what? 9 and 10. Okay. Well, over it, the cherubims of glory, that was two on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, two that were woven into the veil, shattering the mercy seat of which cannot now speak particularly. And when these things were thus ordained, the priests were always in the first tabernacle. They never, the priests didn't go into the Holy of Holies. They only went into the outer tabernacle. Now, we're priests, but he's the high priest over this house of God. And then he says, but into the second with the high priest alone once every year on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement, not without blood, he had to go in with blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Then he talks about the way of the holiest was not made known. The way of the holiest is our hearts. Was not made known while that first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure the word figure is parabole. It's the word parable. It means cast down beside. Parabole. P-A-R-A-B-O-L-E. It comes from para, meaning near. We get our word parallel from that. And B-A-L-L-O is the word ball. It means cast down near, which was a parable which was a parable for the time then present in which, well, hold on a second, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Now, all that's blotted out. That's blotting out the handwriting of rituals. That could not make him that did the service perfect or teleo mature. Those rituals didn't mean anything. He says that down in that 10th chapter, the law having a shout of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continue to make the comers there unto perfect, telios, 
He says the same thing up here in verse 9 of chapter 9. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers, various kinds of washings. But after Jesus was nailed to the cross, all these washings were nailed with him. Don't have time to go there. Am I out of time? How do I have? That's baptism, right? Okay. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Deorthosis means a straightening of the messianic rectification. Until the real true is here, all those rituals were blotted out. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Not blotting out the law. The law is not blotted out. You can't go out there and kill people. Thou shalt not kill. But the law was contained in much more than the Ten Commandments. It was every imperative mood in the Greek. Agonize entering in. Strive. Agonizomai. Humble yourself under the hand of God. Humble. Tapanua. Means to level self before God. Not level self before people. People say, you're not very humble. What, to you or to God? You can't be humble to man and to God at the same time. If you're humble to man, you're bowing to Him. If you're humble to God, you're bowing to God regardless of the man that's standing in front of you. And you will not bow. You don't bow in reverence. You humble yourself like they would bow to one another only when a person has Christ in him and you can see Christ working in him. You, you will, you'll, help, you'll try to help that person that has Christ in him to see truth. Y'all realize how much there is to this? I'd have to read this, all these words, constantly. And he goes on down here in this same chapter. Gosh, I can't get into all of it. Um, this is the chapter, he says, verse 17, where a testament is of force after men are dead. Verse 16, where a testament is, there must be of necessity the death of the testator. The testator is the one who makes the testament. When Jesus said, this cup is the new testament in my blood, to drink of a cup meant to undergo a death, he sang. But that testament is not in effect until the death of Jesus, which was the next day somewhere between 12 and 3. So he wasn't saying drink the cup as a testament. He's saying death to self after I'm dead. That's drinking the cup. I don't even know if people see that. That's very idiomatic language. Very figurative. Here's Jesus, the night before he dies, says, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, but I'm not talking about this cup. I'm talking about death to self because I won't be dead for another 18 plus hours or so. As soon as I die, you drink the cup. Not a cup of grape juice because that ritual will be blotted out, won't it? Do you understand what I just said? Rituals will be blotted out when he's dead. But the rituals weren't blotted out the night before. So he's not saying this cup is the New Testament talking about the, about the fluid in the cup. He's talking about death to self. And it will only be in effect when I'm dead. And that's some hours from then. If they're eating the last Passover and it's 10 o'clock at night, somewhere in that day, 11 or whatever, and the next day, he's going to die somewhere between 12 and 3 o'clock because that's, it was the ninth hour of the day when darkness came over the earth. So 15, 16 hours later is when he dies. He's saying this cup is the New Testament, last will and testament. But it won't take effect till I'm dead. Y'all understand that? He can't be... And when he's nailed to the cross, 
The ritual of the cup is nailed to the cross. The cup of the Passover is nailed to the cross. So it's not effective anymore when he dies. But what is effective is the cup of death to self. Right? Do y'all, do you see that, Gwen? You can't come up 18 hours before your mother dies and go over and say, I want to claim my testament, my last will and testament. She says, but I'm not dead yet. I'll be dead in another 18 hours. <laughs> so drinking of the cup at the Passover was worthless that night. It was a contract he was acting out. He didn't say, this is my body. He said, this esteem my body. This represents my body. And there's one body, the church. How do people miss all this figurative language? I don't know. Just start studying the Bible and look at what it means. Don't believe in passing around crackers and grape juice. There's a form of going on. The primitive Baptist... The primitive Baptist use uh, alcoholic wine. Alcoholic wine is a form of leaven. Leaven was forbidden at the Passover. And some churches use literal wine that will make you drunk. That would be wrong in that using that. Sometimes I want to throw my hands up and just take off down Interstate 40 and run as far as I can. Find me a place out in Arizona and crawl under the ground and say, the world is crazy. I'm going to stay here until they get straight. They're nuts. You tell a preacher this, the testament is not a force till the death of the testator, and Jesus is the testator saying, here's the, the testament, the last will and testament but it's not any good and it won't be a literal cup because the ritual will be nailed to the cross when I'm nailed. That's what he's saying. I hope you understand that. I will never pass around crackers and grape juice and I, I'm the one that invented that term. I bet that offends people. Crackers and grape juice. <laughs> I should say Crackers and fermented wine, because a lot of them do that. All right, do I have any more time, Mike? Three minutes. Huh? Six. Six. Let me tell you what I'm going to do next week. I'm going to do this because this is in line. Back here in Numbers, I'm going to go back through the tithe to, to the... Uh, Levites, because that's where you go to in this, in this 18th chapter of Numbers. This is where God laid down the law for the tithe. The tithe is a tenth, and it's only to be paid to the man who teaches you in all good things. Let a man communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Communicate, kononeo, means to distribute. The tithe is still in effect. I don't care what men say. I, one fellow called it spiritual. Paul called the tithe a carnal thing. He said, if I'm going to preach to you spiritual thing, it should not be any great thing for you to minister to me in carnal things. I'm not out here on the road paying my way. You have an obligation to the people of God to pay the way of the ministry. And don't ever give to somebody who is lying. If you do, you're probably promoting a lie. You're better off to take your tithe and go down to the, buy a bunch of bread, go down here to the park and feed the ducks on Sunday rather than give to a lying preacher. We should never give to preachers who don't tell the truth. We build that false teaching ministry when we do. I'll go through that next week. I've, I've got so many places.
that I want to go. If you notice, when we got to Hebrews, it took me all the way back to that wilderness. Everything that we're going through today is what they were going through back then. It might have had a different image to it. It might have been, been a bunch of these children of Anak. What kind of a giant are you fighting? Your bills? You don't fight them. I think if everybody would calm down and slow down and be very frugal with their money, tight. I'm tight with money. I don't go blow money out here in the world. I just don't. And uh, if you can learn that, a lot of people can't tithe because they spend, spend, spend. And I believe in the tithe that I don't believe in the 8th and ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians where the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. That is a message to the people that were giving to the poor in the first century when they didn't have anything. Israel was under attack from Rome. Uh, they were going to slaughter them. 70 A.D. They're, when you're in the 8th and ninth chapter of 2 Corinthians, every commentary will say, this is the benevolent chapter, and it's to the people that are in Jerusalem that's under attack from the Roman armies, and they trapped them at Masada on that mountain uh, out there close to the Dead Sea and slaughtered all of the Jews. And they were hungry. They didn't have any food. And Paul said, God loves a cheerful giver that gives to the poor. And Titus was coming in. He was going to pick up this money for the food to take back to Jerusalem. It's not about God loves a cheerful giver and that's all he cares what you give. It's like one preacher said, why would God give you all these rules in the book? You just turn around and say, well, however you want to give to the ministry, that's between yeah, whatever you want to do. God's not that harebrained. Do I believe in tithing? Yes, I do. Do I tithe? Yes. Does my wife tithe? Yes. I don't tell her what to give. She don't tell me what to give. And I don't know why people think we don't need a tithe because it, we got all these lights and got all the equipment we have to buy and we have to re have repairs and we buy, I don't know, fifteen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800 worth of uh, mailing paraphernalia and stamps. We've got five full-time workers here, and if we didn't have all this, we wouldn't be able to do this ministry because we've got a few people here. These few people here can't come up with our, our minimum amount we need. We need thirty five to 38000 every month to stay in business, and it's coming in from people all around the country. Well, I'm out of time. I'm going to continue in the Old Testament. If you'll notice, this rest has to do with predestination and the sovereignty of God. I can't get off that subject. Believing God, God's preordained everything to be. You'll either believe it or you won't. You're not going to change it with your worries and your stress. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth. Help us, Lord, to get a hold of these truths. Lord, I'm getting real tired. I pray you'll give me strength to keep going as long as you want. I pray for the church. I pray for the elect, Lord. Lead us to your elect. Fight our battles. We know you're doing that. We know all these things are your will. And we thank you for it all. In Christ's name we pray, man. What you doing there, girl? You got it that all memorized? Yeah. Huh. Did you get it all memorized? Yeah. Are you gonna are you gonna Repeat it.
No. <laughs> I love you. To give to my I friends. love you. I gave seven discs uh, to my friends. You want? I gave seven discs CDs to my friends. You gave 70 CDs? Seven CDs. Seven? Can they have some? Are those DVDs or did you give DVDs. them the... You didn't give them the papers, did you? No. You gave them DVDs? DVDs. Did you really? Yeah. Good Can for Can I you. give DVDs too? Huh? I want to give DVDs to my friends. You want some DVDs to give to your friends? I could even give She gave a seven friend. DVDs to her friends at school. That's good. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Brother Dave, Dave, I love you. That was good, Matthew 13, 32. I always, meant what, I, I always go, why would they put that in there? Now I get it. Yeah, it's the way it grows. It's yeah. not... If you got the faith, it's a little as a grain of mustard seed. The, bird, the birds lodging on the branches, I never understood. I go, why would they put that in there? That because the birds it? love the mustard exactly, seed. Exactly, I get it now. They could devour it. They could destroy your life when you're little faith. When your faith grows, they can come hang in your life, and they can't do anything to you. And the bird's Satan, and he lodges yeah. on us, but he can't do anything to us. When it. your faith is strong. Wow. When your faith grows, he yeah. can't do anything. I never yeah. thought of that. Yeah. It's well, it's because you don't know it. If yeah. you look up mustard seed in the McClinic and Strong, it'll tell you. All right. I'm going to do that. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Dave. I'm glad you are my friend. I'll see you manana at the house. Manana, manana. Manana is good enough for me. I don't speak Spanish, and that's a Spanish song. I'm going to make, make my way home and then go to bed. Oh, I love you, man. I really do. Okay.